Welcome to Heine House Live, a podcast about the exciting and ever-changing world of gaming and, and technology. technology. Heine House Live is available <laughs> on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you, you listen, listen to podcasts. podcasts. For all other info, including links to our community, community Discord, Discord, live video, video feed, episode, episode archive, and a whole host of other great, great entertainment, entertainment, please visit HeineHouse.com. La la la, la 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 la. Y'all know where to go. Ding, 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 ding. Mm-mm. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, hello, hello. How are you doing? It is such a pleasure to see all of you. Thank you for being here. This is Heine House Live Podcast, episode number 33. Currently recording on November 18th, 2019. We're winding down 2019, and all I have to say is thank God. <laughs> This year has been crazy for me in general. So I'm excited to start 2020 strong, excited, ambitious. And uh, yeah, we're going to we're going to roll into it. Um, Social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Heine House is the hashtag. Of course, you can send me a voicemail. You want to chat. You want to give me a comment, a suggestion. You want to say something. You want to tell me a story. You want to tell me a gaming memory. You want to do something of that nature. Maybe you want to talk about something not even related to gaming. Sometimes you want to dive deep into some personal stuff. You want to talk about other things. You know, I'm an emotional guy. I can talk about that with you. I'd be happy to. 503-908-5490 is the phone number again. Oh, you didn't have a pencil or pen? No, no worries. No worries. We got you. 503-908-5490. You know, what the hell? We're, we're recording this live right now. We're live on Twitch. Twitch.tv slash the Heine House. You know, I'm starting to roll this in more and more. Uh, did the first, you know, 30 or so episodes working out the kinks, getting the bugs out. And now we're going whole hog. We're going live. So we're live on Twitch. And you can catch the episodes there weekly when we record them, usually Sunday or Monday nights, depending on my schedule and how busy I am. But we are live. It's Monday night. So uh, I've got a live chat room in there waving to everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you so much. And uh, Narkill, my man, George, thank you. He just subbed 28 months in a row. My goodness. Thank you so much. Adam, Soulstorm, uh, Glav. We got Hustino in there. Of course, Phantom Jazz, Soulstorm, and a whole bunch of other great folks. Thank you so much for joining. Um, We have a lot to talk about in this episode. So before we get into it, though, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our newest Patron on the Game Loft tier, Justin Spadee. What up, Justin? Thank you. Very, very, very. Oh, fuck. Oh, wait, wrong one. Hold on. Where is it? Bruh. You get the bruh. What? 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 Bruh. Thank you so much, Justin. I really, really Winner. appreciate you for joining the Game Loft tier. He's getting in on that new EP that's coming out on the 25th. Boy, oh boy, do I have plugs, man. This is, this is you know, it's exciting because... This is a very exciting time. Lots of great content happening. Lots of great entertainment. New music, new shows, new ways of doing things. Again, trying to inspire, trying to just keep on keeping on. So thank you so much. Cheers. Round of applause. Justin, appreciate you. And of course, everyone on the board that you see here, all the Game Loft patrons, the main floor patrons, and the ground floor tier. Thank you, guys and gals. Patreon.com slash Jason Heine. The reason the show's even alive today is because of you all. In fact, if you all weren't on that page, simply put, I probably just wouldn't do the show. It's that simple. Um, It's great to have some reoccurring revenue for the show and to keep it alive and to pay all of the hosting for it. All right. Real talk, man. I don't, I don't hold back. No, no, uh, no bullshit. Uh, We, you know what? I, uh, I don't even want to, uh, I don't even want to BS anymore. This just happened. All right, this just happened. Valve announces a new Half-Life game about 45 minutes ago as of recording this. Maybe it was close to 50 minutes now. 50 minutes ago, they just posted, all right? And I just saw this before. I was I turned the computer on. I'm getting shit set up. I'm over here, like, plugging stuff in, turning the camera on. And all of a sudden, I just see this tweet, like, new Half-Life game. And I'm like, bruh, what? Bruh. Bruh, what? Bruh. What? There it is. Uh, yeah, Half-Life Alex was just announced 20, let's see. Oh, I wrote 23 minutes ago. That's when I wrote this. About an hour ago now, 50 minutes ago. 
Surprise tweet from Valve's brand new verified Twitter account confirmed that we are going to be getting a Half-Life game called Half-Life Alex. Now, rumors of when I woke up this morning, I started seeing rumors and everyone was talking like new Half-Life game, new Half-Life game. We get these rumors all the time, all the time. So I don't even like pay attention to them anymore, but this one's official. It's the real deal. It's going to be a virtual reality, a VR experience. That's right, a VR experience. Now, uh, we don't know much about it uh, other than the fact that it, it's, it's Half-Life Alex, which is probably going after the Alex Vance character in the game. All right, I'm, I'm assuming that's pretty, pretty straightforward there. Um, but people are saying that this is going to be pretty much Valve's flagship VR game that they're making. Uh, this Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific time, they're going to be talking about it and showing off some stuff, which is this, that's like right around the corner. This is very, very exciting. So, uh, yeah, ex excited. And I don't know what to expect, to be honest. Um, it's probably going to be amazing from Valve, of course. I mean, why would it not be? Uh, this is the first official Half-Life game for most, most people know. But for any of you who do not know, this is the first Half-Life game that's been uh, released since Half-Life 2 Episode 2 which was back in 2007, actually October, I believe. We just celebrated 12 year anniversary. <laughs> Jeez, cheese and rice, bruh. Um, yeah, very exciting. Very exciting. And what is this gonna be? I don't know. You know, uh, get in Discord. Let's talk about it. Hit me up in the comments on YouTube. Let's talk about it. You know, what do you think? What's it gonna be like? Um, are you going to buy it? Do you have a PC VR? There's the more important question. Now, we've had actually lots of discussions recently about VR. And you guys know, I'm like excited for it. Uh, and, and like VR in general, like I want a PC VR system. Valve Index is a thousand bucks. That's a big chunk of money. Can't spend that kind of money on a VR headset. And now they announce this and I'm just like, fuck, man, what to do? But here's the thing. Now, Valve Index hasn't been out that long. Anyway, these are just, again, these are just some of my thoughts. So Valve Index hasn't been out that long, right? Has it sold well? Well, early indications are yes, it has sold out. Uh, when they launched it, it sold out within the first day. Now, is that a shortage issue or is that a popularity issue? Again, we don't know. We don't know these numbers. I don't have those figures. I can't guess. I can't say. I can just give my opinion. So my opinion is I'm sort of like I'm borderlining this. Valve Index either... It didn't sell well, which I think it did, by the way, but I think it either didn't sell well or sell enough. There wasn't enough interest to where they then went back to the drawing board and said, okay, I know we've been planning this Half-Life VR game for the last six or seven years. Is it ready? Can we launch it now? Can we, can we really just hit this and sell these units? I'm just saying, like, I'm just saying, is that, do you think that's realistic? Or are they just truly like, hey, fuck it. You know, we released this uh, index. It's great. It's, it's perfect. It's wonderful. And here comes the game for it. This is our killer app. This is what we're going to do. And boom, let's launch it. I don't know. I have a lot of thoughts and emotions. Like a part of me is like, you know what that is? So here's here's the, here's the, uh, the angel devil part of me. Like the angel part of me is like, wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much for bringing Half-Life back. We're excited. Like, this is great. We're going to buy it. This is awesome. Devil part of me is like, well... You need a VR headset, bruh. You know, you need the VR headset. And it's like, that is a dirty, dirty dick move of a way of bringing Val, bringing Half-Life back, right? That is a dirty dick way to bring back a franchise that they left stagnant for 12 years to bring it back and force you into the VR just to sell units. Look, these are just my thoughts, okay? I'm not like, I'm not sitting here. I don't know any of this shit. I'm just saying, this is what it seems like. After 12 years, we finally get Half-Life, but it's only fucking exclusive to VR. I don't know. That's kind of like Dirty Dick. I don't even know what the fuck I'm reading. I don't know. Do you agree? Do you disagree? It's totally cool. Like, it's open. Like, either way, we're all in a good position because we're getting a new Half-Life game. This is good. But why on VR? Very interesting. Great discussion there. I hope we can talk more about it. Uh... I'm going to jump right into some gaming news. I got great. I have some gaming news. We have some tech news. We have this week in gaming history coming up. And um, yeah, then that pretty much wraps up the show. Let's talk about it. Gaming news. This week's been pretty interesting. Um, the official, you guys, you guys may have seen this. 
the official Call of Duty Twitch account was hacked earlier this week. And for about five minutes or so on Sunday, so basically a week ago, a week and a day ago, um, it was controlled by a hacker who used the opportunity to promote various music videos. Uh, the streamer peaked at just about 7,000 viewers before it was shut down and terminated. Now, I don't know. I don't know if um, I honestly, I don't know if it was the streamer's own music or like other music, but uh, it didn't take long for Activision to act. Oh, that's a dirty pun. What? Dirty pun. Um, to take control of the channel back. They cut the broadcast in the middle of a music video. Chat was also cleared as viewers cheered. People were like, oh my God, this is hilarious. Um, some people were in genuinely intrigued by the music and all the VODs were deleted. There's actually, I couldn't find any evidence or even, I don't know, maybe there's some stuff on dark web, but I don't go on there. There, there might be some footage of it out there, but uh, you never know. Uh, but there's no evidence of it even happening. Now, I say this kind of lighthearted and joking like, aha, funny, funny, funny. But, you know, reality is it could have been a lot worse. It could have been very, very bad. We have had, I hate to say it. I hate to say it, but we've had many instances where people have taken control of channels, uh, Facebook accounts, Twitch accounts, YouTube accounts, and then live streamed very horrific acts, uh, shootings and school shootings and other horrible tragedies. And so, I'm thankful it wasn't like that. It could have been a lot worse. Um, but still, you know, so I say it, I say it lighthearted, but there's also this reality that could have been a lot worse. And I'm just glad that it wasn't. So uh, moving on from that, what is up with singles day? Singles day. Okay. Evidently this was a, this has been going on for a while in China, I guess, I guess the site from what I read, the site Alibaba who sells stuff, it's like a online retailer importer. They created this like singles day sale like years ago. Okay. I'd never heard about it. And this is the first year that we heard about it. And singles day is because of the date 11, 11, it's all ones singles, right? Get it. Okay. So singles day, um, there were some sales that were going on. <laughs> it's like, you know, any opportunity to have a sale, whether you're, you know, Steam sale or, you know, game sales, Alibaba, you know, who knows? Um, I don't know. I feel like every year I hear about a new type of sale, like an excuse for a sale, like, oh, it's National French Friday. So every video game that relates to food is on sale, which actually is a pretty good idea, don't you think? Um, November 11th, Singles Day. And what was on sale? Well, evidently, it's one of the world's biggest online shopping events with almost... $31 billion made just last year. Had no idea. I'm living under a rock. Steam had their own singles day sale because of it. So this is the first time I've heard of it. A mix of single player and some multiplayer games, but mostly single player games on sale. I think that's great. It's pretty cool. I didn't pick up anything, but by the time I heard about it, it was uh, the day was over. I think they did it just till like 7 or 8 a.m. the next day. Something like that. So... <laughs> Uh, I'm just loving all the uh, emotes in the Twitch chat. Hilarious. There's a big hot dog there. Someone posted lunch <laughs> of a rev. I love it. So good. Um, okay. This is actually this. Okay. I'm going to talk about Google Stadia. And before you all leave the chat and before you log out of your podcasting app and shut everything down, this actually turned out to be a much longer, uh, news topic than I thought because we had we had kind of have it in two parts so the original article and I wrote this three days ago the original article read like this and then we have an update that just happened earlier today which they're gonna they're bringing 10 more games out anyway so let's start from the beginning let's play it out let's role play as if as if uh, how it was going to originally play so Google Stadia will not launch with promised games the games they promised to have at launch they are not having it this has since been changed, but it's okay. We're following, we're playing role play here. Google announced 12 games that will be available for individual purchase and streaming when the Founders Edition pre-orders get their hands on Google Stadia starting November 19th. That's tomorrow as of recording this. The games are that are included Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Destiny 2, Guild, Just Dance 2020, Kine. Is it Kine or Keen? K-I-N-E. It's Kine. Mortal Kombat 11, Red Dead Redemption 2, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Samurai Showdown, 
Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Thumper, and Tomb Raider Definitive Edition. Those are the, the games that are included day one. Now, there were originally 14 additional titles that were promised at launch for Stadia that are not included. Those are Attack on Titan 2, Borderlands 3, Darksiders Genesis, Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, Farming Sim 2019, Final Fantasy 15, Football Manager 2020, Ghost Recon Breakpoint, Grid, Metro Exodus, NBA 2K20, Rage 2, Trials Rising, and Wolfenstein Youngblood. I know there's a lot here. Just bear with me. Those were promised that they were not included. Um, and a number of legacy titles that were previously promised as part of the Stadia launch window currently were not included either. That is Crew 2, Destroy All Humans, 2016's Doom, Elder Scrolls Online, Power Rangers, Battle for the Grid, Super Hot, and Windjammers 2. All those were not included. Well, and also major publishers Capcom and EA were also absent from the current launch lineup. So this is all looking to be a fucking disaster. Just a disaster all across the board. Games aren't there. Developers and publishers aren't there. Houston, we have a problem. We got some problems. Stop it. Get, get, get some help. So what happened? Well, all this news broke a few days ago, and I think people internally at Google were fucking panicking. So much, in fact, that they went back and they changed it. There was an update like earlier today. I read that. A list of games, 10 more games were added to the launch window. And I think this is kind of funny. So... Look at it in the big picture here. Don't, don't look at it as like on, at the surface. Look a little deeper. They originally planned this many games to come out. They cut back on that promise. But reality is they had the games that were already ready to go. They just held them back. For what? Why would they hold them back? To like stagger them out? To like give more games like throughout the next couple of months? When they're already ready to go, but they already promised to release it. That's kind of dirty. Why would you do that? Because here we are three days later. Oh, uh, we developed the game and uh, we had three days of time to get them on Stadia and uh, did this magically work. No, they were already ready to go. That's some horse shit. They added 10 more games today for launch tomorrow. Attack on Titan, Final Battle 2, Farming Sim 2019, Final Fantasy 15, Football Manager 2020, Grid, which I have some updates on that too, by the way, because I really I like that game. Uh, Metro Exodus, NBA 2K20, Rage 2, Trials Rising, and Wolfenstein Young Blood. And honestly, I think the lineup is pretty good to start. I think they have some really good games, some heavy hitters in there. I just think that's another dirty ass move that they've done. Why would they do that? I know I talk. I'm talking a lot about Stadia, and the thing is, is I didn't pre-order Stadia. I'm not getting Stadia. Like I'm. I'm not really interested in the stadium. I just think it's another dirty, dirty move for them to do this. Um, why? Why? I guess there's some other features too that won't be available day one. All this stuff is kind of common, common sense in a way. Like you would think that some features would be there day one, but they're all not going to be there. Stream connect, state share, and crowd play. Uh, Stadia's achievement system. The ability to use existing Chromecast Ultras to play games, family sharing, and buddy passes. All those features will not be available day one. And for whatever reason, they're staggering out the uh, controllers. They're shipping out the controllers in a staggered uh, event. Maybe they've sold a lot and they need to stagger them. They're saying that they are sending them in the order in which the orders were received. That's kind of dirty. <laughs> Again, another one like, hey, man, if we all... If we all went in and pre-ordered before the launch, we should be able to get within that window to where the first shipments go out. Not like if you ordered seven days before me during pre-order and then I ordered seven days later, still during pre-order, I don't think I should be penalized for having to, I mean, you pre-order, you pre-order, you know? Oh, geez, what is going on? So people are like, wait, I'm not going to get my controller for like another three or four days after launch. Like what? And I can't, what the fuck? It's just a big mess. Honestly, who else? Let me see in chat. Who agrees that this is going to fail? I want to see a yeah, and I want to see a no. Are we going to, is this going to fail? 
I'm thinking that it's going to take a while. And I think Google will shovel so much money down his throat in order to try to keep it alive. I don't know. I, I just, I don't think it's going to do well. Um, okay. Enough about Stadia. We saw this earlier in the week. Guess what folks? Sainik is back and he's looking proper. Yay. Round of applause. Sainik. The new Sonic the Hedgehog trailer from Paramount Pictures was released earlier this week. And wow. And I know we've all seen it. This is all, this is all not new news, but I just want to bring attention to it because it was such a big issue earlier in the year. One of the biggest blunders of 2019, I would say. The movie trailer was Sonic the Hedgehog. He looked terrible. And they finally went back to the drawing board, I'll say, and uh, remade him. And now he looks legit. Actually, I have some pictures to show. Be happy to do so. Where's my... There it is. So here's the new, here's the new Sonic. You know, and uh, honestly, he looks great. I love the way he looks. He's, everything looks pretty much like Sonic should. The eyes are correct. The, the mouth is, is right. Even the nose and the eyebrows, which they've added, the ears look good. It's all legit. This was the old Sonic. <laughs> God. Eh. Look at that. Oh, no keyboard. Go down. No, down boy. <laughs> this is almost scary. Look at that. It's almost scary. That's my face looking at the old Sonic right there. And then I have this little shot of a comparison of the two. And, you know, honestly, when you, when you look at this, when you look at these two, it makes you wonder their intentions. And to be honest, I almost feel like they made Sonic that way for a reason. Like they knew he was fucked up and they knew they were going to get backlash. Honestly, I kind of feel like they did it to get attention. I mean, do you think you wouldn't get attention of a Sonic film? Like everyone loves Sonic. So I don't know. Crazy shit, man. But he was ugly. Do I just zoom in on him there for you? No, let's not do that. Terrible. So yeah, the new trailer came out and the movie looks really, really good. And uh, yeah, we absolutely will be going and seeing that when it comes out. Pretty good stuff. Um, we have some other stuff. I have some, just some brief um, information about Grid 2019. Now I know a lot, not everyone plays Grid, so I won't spend a lot of time here, but there was something that happened in Grid and it kind of sparked a conversation within me. And I want to bring this up and then it made me actually think about doing an after party talking about this, this subject about hardware and software and developing and stuff like that. But let's, so just hear me out here. So grid 2019, that's the new code masters racing game. It was released earlier this year. Uh, what a month ago, month and a half ago, I picked it up. I love it. It's great. Um, all the hardcore fans are hating, but I mean, I really like it for, for what it is. It's fun. It's good multiplayer. They're patching it and updating. It. It's pretty good. Anyway, what they announced was the first announcement was grid will not come out on stadia day one when they originally said it did. Then news earlier today said it is coming out. And in fact, they're going to have a exclusive mode to stadia in multiplayer. You're going to now have 40 cars that you can race against 40 car multiplayer. That's only exclusive to stadia. Now in PC and consoles, I believe it's 12 um, or is it 24? No, I think it's 12. So with that being said, I was like, wow, what the fuck? Why, why don't we get all, why don't we get that? So there's one or two ways. Put, put the game aside, put grid aside. It could be any game. Pick your favorite game. It could be anything. The fact, like I'm looking at this and I'm saying, are they doing this as a marketing ploy? Could they have done this already with consoles and PC? Could they have already done the 40 car, but they're doing it just on Stadia to, to generate buzz? That's thought number one which could be, could very well be. I don't know. Thought number two is think of the logistics and think of the actual hardware that we have here. Google Stadia is going to be hosted and ran on hardware controlled by Google in controlled environments in their server room and probably a massive warehouse, probably the size of Costco, if not bigger, with just servers and computers 
that are like state of the art, top notch. These these PCs are the best of the best, and they're always going to be updated. They're always going to have the best and cutting edge technology. Now, that is a what I call controlled environment, right? They have control over the hardware. So, where are the variables outside of that? Well, on PC, everyone has a different configuration. Very rarely do we have the exact same configuration. You either have different RAM, a different processor, or different speeds. You have a different GPU with different specs. You know, you've got this and you've got that. You're running different OSs. You're on different revisions. Oh my goodness. We have all these different issues here, right? So that's why, that's why we have weird issues on PC sometimes of games having compatibility issues and not running properly because um, we have all these different variables, right? Now, you can kind of argue that console doesn't really have that. The console is what it is. The hardware is what it is, and it doesn't change. You can't, other than changing on hard drives, you can't really change the state of your console. You can't update GPU or CPU. You can't update the RAM. You can't do any of that. You can add additional storage, but that's about it. So that's more of a controlled environment as well. Typically, I don't want to get any hate. Please don't yell at me, but usually it's a little underpowered compared to some PC counterparts. Not always. You can buy an entry-level piece of shit PC and it will be lower tier than even consoles. I'm just saying, in most cases, it is a underpowered machine compared to a lot of PCs. But of course, you pay more for the PC for that. All right, we're not going to get into that argument and debate it. But the thing is, is that with Google Stadia, we have a controlled environment. All right, so we have developers. Of course, they're taking old, old games at this point. But we're taking games that we develop, that we develop these games, and we're now saying we want to, we want them to run on your system. What is your system? And Google says, well, these powerhouse PCs are this, 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 and this. It's a controlled environment. It will not change. They're the best of the best. We're good to go. Developers can then develop for that with that PC and make it run perfectly and optimize it perfectly. Right? That makes sense. So talking about the 40 cars that you can race in grid yes it applies to this subject but what else could this apply to i think we have a lot of other variables a lot of other games that could develop and optimize their game and better uh with better performance better fidelity more features and a lot of other stuff because google stadia has a controlled environment i i don't know why i mean i'm not meaning to talk about stadia so much i'm just this is a new gaming kind of like revelation here like this isn't new in general like on live existed i mean shit i played sega channel in fucking 1992 or 93 whenever it came out i played sega channel the first time i played road rash was on sega channel so like st game streaming has been around or tried to be around for a very very long time so um yeah you know with all this being said is i think i'm gonna actually do an after party i'm gonna talk about this in, in greater detail because i think i have a lot of stuff to talk about um it's a good opportunity to plug it. Um, Patreon.com slash Jason Heine is where you can get in on the after party. I do those one, one to maybe two a month. And I talk about topics like this that I want to go in more detail. It's usually between a half hour to an hour episode. Uh, so go on Patreon, check that out. I'd love to have you. Um, yeah, but man, what, what would you, what do you think? I mean, can you optimize our games going to run better on stadia because they're optimized? I don't think so. Why? Because we have ISP issues, connectivity and internet. Anyway, we can go on and on and on. It's, it's kind of a, it's a crazy thing. I don't know. I'm talking a lot about Stadia because this is launching tomorrow. This is happening. And I'm interested to see if it's going to be a train crash in slow motion, or it's going to set its sails and spread its wings and take flight. And we're, we're, we're battling with the long arm of Google with all of its money and resources. But then we also have one of the most important aspects of this, the customers. Will you be buying it? Moving on to some gaming news, the Nintendo 64, the amazing Nintendo 64. I have that pretty well represented behind me here with the Toys R Us gold edition. Very nice. A couple of my favorite games, perfect dark cruising world, Diddy Kong racing. I don't know if you can see him. My mic's in the way. Um, the Nintendo 64 spiked on eBay in sales. It's actually up 205% in sales on eBay right now, which by the way, stay the fuck away from eBay. Do not be buying or selling on there. That shit is just, 
scary, scary. I wouldn't do it if I were you, but hey, you can do what you want. Just my suggestion. Uh, Nintendo holds the top three spots on eBay, to be honest, under gaming. Most surprisingly, entry on that list was the Nintendo 64. It saw a 205% year-over-year increase in sales in September. In fact, that was enough to put it at number two on the list. Whoa. The rest of the list, uh, the top five consoles in gaming were number one, the Nintendo Switch. Number two, the Nintendo 64. Number three, Super Mario. Number four, Xbox One. And number five, Call of Duty. Call of Duty is on there just because the game just came out and it's one of the most popular games ever. So I wonder what number I wonder what number six and number seven were. I don't know. But yeah, very interesting. I think I think we're gonna have a uh, a movement, you know, another movement in gaming. And uh the Nintendo 64 is right, it's right on the cusp of this, folks. <sighs> I've been saying this for years, and there's definitely a time to collect. Uh, for gaming, there's definitely a time to get into gaming and it definitely has its strengths and weaknesses, right? The Nintendo 64, that's the love it or hate it console. Everyone I talk to, you either love it or you absolutely hate it. You hate everything about it. But I, even still, I think we're going to have a, a movement here in the next year or two with the Nintendo 64 coming back around. And I think it's great. We should. I think it's a great console. Yeah, no, not the best console. It's a little rough around the edges, very rough around the edges on some games, but <clears throat> it sure is a great multiplayer console. Mario Party, Smash Bros. I mean, shit, even Micro Machines and a bunch of other great, great games. Wave Race. I mean, you name it. It has excellent games and a lot of fun. Um, so, yeah, take keep an eye on N64 because that is going to be uh, doing some crazy shit, I think, here in the next year or two, which is fantastic. I never got rid of any of my N64 stuff. Um, I have quite a few um, consoles and accessories, and I have, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I think I've admitted it enough times in the past. I do have a complete, fantastic N64 collection, all with at least two matching uh, brand new controllers, all in padded safety rental cases. I have a weird fetish for rental cases, <sighs> and uh, I put all my N64s in there. And I think this is a good time. Maybe next year I will do like an overview and talk about them and show them off and like let people see and talk about the history of the Nintendo 64. It could be a good time because no November's uh, actually we're going to get into this week in gaming history next because you're going to see November on top of it being a huge month for gaming releases. It's actually a massive month for Nintendo consoles being released. What do I mean by that? Well, you know what I mean by that. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? For this week in gaming history. Yeah. Everyone's favorite section where I talk about games that have been released in the past during the week this podcast is out. We're going to be talking about November 18th through November 23rd. Are you guys ready to go? Then buckle up. Let's roll. November 18th. In 1999, Chrono Cross in Japan on PS1 was released. Here we go. Coming out strong in 2001. The, the GameCube Game console. Game. Oh, yeah. <sighs> yeah, baby. An amazing console that it is. I loved it. I love the GameCube. Still do to this day. In fact, one of the great reasons to have a Nintendo Wii, uh, uh, the original one anyway, is that it plays... Uh, GameCube, good stuff. Uh, in 2003, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic on PC was released. Here we are again in 2012, the, the Wii, Wii U Wii console. Wii. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where that ranks on the list of like failure consoles. Like, I know, I know it's not Virtual Boy status, obviously, but. How much further off is it from that? I don't hate the Wii U. I'm just saying it didn't, it didn't do what they, they thought it would do. They got it right with Switch. That is for sure. Facts, folks. Uh, 2014, Dragon, Dragon Age Inquisition on PC, PS3, PS4, and Xbox One was released. 
2014, Far Cry 4 on Xbox One and PS4 was released. And 2014, last on November 18th, Grand Theft Auto Online and Grand Theft Auto 5 on PS4 and Xbox One was released. <laughs> I just glance over and see the emotes every once in a while. They just crack me up. You guys are hilarious. Good to see you all in chat. Thanks for being here. Uh, November 19th. Uh, 1993. Wow, an early one. What is this? This is Sonic CD on the Sega CD. Let's not get Steph triggered. She loves the Sega CD. Um, folks, in 1998, we're just talking about it, but this is the OG, the original. 1998 Half-Life on PC was released. 2001, Return to Caffle Wolfenstein on PC. I did pick that up in 2001. Uh, great game. I really like it. Um, this is probably one of my favorite days of the whole, the whole shebang here. And uh, if I would have had more time and more preparation, I probably would have pulled... On, you know what? Honestly, you know what? Maybe next year in November, I'll do it. I'll set up all the consoles that are like being released and show them off. But... Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest here, and this is my, just, I am near and dear, and it gets me very emotional. Every time I think about it, I have, I have a, st a story about it. I have my history about it. Maybe I'll make a video specifically to talk about it, about how I waited overnight and how it turned out and what happened. Oh, it was great. Ladies, Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, in 2006, November 19th, the Nintendo Wii console. We're right here, Wii Sports, right behind me. Amazing stuff right here. I love the Nintendo Wii. And of course, same day, 2006. There were a bunch of other games too, but uh, I just kind of broke it down. Wii Sports was released. And of course, same year, same day, Legend of Zelda, Twilight Princess, Excite Truck, Call of Duty. There was, there's a whole host of them on there that were released on this day. So good. All right, moving on to a year later in 2007, Mario Party DS was released. And that wraps up November 19th. Moving on, November 20th in 2000, Banjo-Tooie on N64 was released. In 2004, another great, great handheld, the successor to the Game Boy Advance. Ladies and gentlemen, Nintendo DS was released. November 20th in 2004. How about that? Damn, 15 years old. Think about it. 15 years old. Um, same day, same year. Super Mario 64 DS. I think that was a launch title, right? I think it launched with that. Uh, 2007. Mass Erect, or, I'm sorry. Sorry. A Mass Effect on 360. What did I say? Erect? <laughs> what am I talking about? This is, what, my, stiff? What, what am I talking about? I don't know. I didn't mean anything. Um, a 2007 Rock Band on 360 was released. Moving on to 2011 Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword on Wii. Damn, think about it. Think about that. Wow. Quite a, quite a few years after the launch of the Wii, we finally got Skyward Sword. I remember that. Holy shit, that took them a long time to make that. Well... To be honest, the first two years that Wii was out, no one could get a no one could get a console. They were sold out everywhere, so that kind of makes sense. They waited till they were kind of mass available to the masses. Um, in 2012, PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale on PS3. That was in 2012, man. And you know what? The funny story about that, I remember actually Steph and I went. That was the first uh, packs that Stephanie and I went to together. And um, I remember playing that game at the Sony booth and uh, really enjoying it. I remember that. That was such a good time. There was a lot of cool stuff at PAX 2012. I remember that. Sega All-Stars Racing. There was a Sony All-Stars Battle Royale. There was, uh, what was that other cart game that we played? It was uh, Plants vs. Zombies, something or other. And then there was something karting. I don't remember what it was, something. Little Big Planet Carding. Thank you, Steph. Yes, that's what it was. A lot of cool stuff that happened that time. Awesome stuff. Um, all right, moving on to the next day, November 21st. This is a big one. I have a lot of games in here, folks. Buckle in. Get, get your seatbelts seat belts on. on. 
1990, ladies and gentlemen, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Wow. Wow. So many amazing Nintendo consoles were released in November. This is huge. And as such, same day, same year, Super Mario World, one of the best and one of my favorite Mario entries. Uh, this was in Japan, by the way. Um, in 1991, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past on Super Nintendo in Japan was released. What's your favorite Zelda game? Mine's probably Link to the Past, I must say. I must say. Um, 1992, moving on to the next year, Sanic the Hedgehog 2 on Genesis in Japan was released. In 1995, Donkey Kong Country 2 in Japan was released. Amazing game. Incredible. We got a lot of, we got a lot of Kongs going on here. 1997, two years later, Diddy Kong Racing on N64 in Japan right here. Chilling right behind me. Great game. Lovely. One of the best kart racing games. And might I say better than better than uh, Mario Kart 64? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to trigger anyone. I'm just saying. Just much more of a much more of a, of a game and more experience in there. 2001 Super Smash Bros. Melee on GameCube in Japan. Yes, in the emotes, we got Soulstorm with the Donkey Kong emotes. Well played. Perfect timing. Hey, how about some more in 2010? Donkey Kong Country Returns on Wii. I did pick that up on day one. Holy shit, why is that game so difficult? The difficulty is so freaking high. I don't know, I always was upset with that game because we come from Donkey Kong Country on Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and, it, and we've talked about this before, but it is pure, pure and simple, honest platforming bliss. Especially the first game. Yeah, second is a better game. Yes, we all know that. It's much more, has more content, more stuff to do. Graphics, audio, everything's like upgraded. But the first game, it's it's just pure, practical, honest platforming. It's just perfect platforming. And then this one, 2010, Donkey Kong Country Returns, man. It was beautiful, but why was it so fucking difficult? I couldn't, couldn't pass. I feel like, God, I'm such a dumbass. Um, hey, 2017, folks, here we go. Animal Droppings, Pocket Camp on Android. <laughs> Stephanie's life was forever changed. Forever changed. In fact, uh, I, I, don't, I don't even know, man. You know, I go to bed at night and she's in there just playing and, you know, I'm just chop liver. You know, she's, she's moved on. I, honestly, the only way for me to get her attention now is to dress up in the Tom Nook outfit and then get into bed dressed as Tom Nook. And she's like, oh, hey. Mr. Nook, good to see you. You know? Other than that, she doesn't notice me. <laughs> oh, fuck. Holy shit. Moving on to the next day, November 22nd. In 1994, the Sega Saturn console in Japan was released. Let's give it up. Sega Saturn. The underdog. The oddball out. The odd man out. Very, very odd. Um, yeah, wow. What can I say about that? What can I say about that? Uh, 2005, the Xbox 360 console. Whoa! It is, it is the, uh, the month of consoles, folks. How about it? How about it? 2010, Red Dead Redemption on PS3 and 360. 2013, Dead Rising 3. On Xbox One. 2013, Killer Instinct on Xbox One. The reboot, amazing. So cool to get a reboot. And uh, they included the original game on that too, which was very, very nice. Uh, 2013, Super Mario 3D World on Wii U. Also in 2013, Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Two Worlds on 3DS was released. And lastly, on November 22nd, what a big day for gaming. In 2013, the Xbox One console. Yeah. And we're down to our last day here, folks. November 23rd. This is great. I, don't you love this? I love just like thinking back, hearing these games, and then reliving the memories 
of when we used to play them and go through them. I just, that's why I do this section. I hope it sparks nostalgia and I hope it, it sparks great memories for all of us. Last day here, November 23rd in 1991, Final Fantasy II on Super Nintendo. 1996, Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble on Super Nintendo in Japan. And uh, yeah, we'll just, uh, we'll just leave that one there. Not my favorite. <laughs> Uh, in 1998, dude, should I just call this the fucking Legend of Zelda month? Because really, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time on N64 was released. In 1999, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six on PS1 was released. Rainbow Six, a great franchise. Been around a very, very long time. Still very active. In fact, in the competitive world, even to this day. In 2001, Shenmue 2 on the Dreamcast. Finally, we get a little Dreamcast love on here. And to wrap it up for this week in gaming history, in 2004, everyone's favorite, World of Warcraft. That was this week in gaming history. Yes, good stuff. Let me take a little sippy poo of some water here. Hmm. Good stuff. Um, I'm going to move on to some tech news. How about it? Some tech news. You want to hear about some stuff that's going on in the world of tech this week, the highs and lows. Something I read today. Um, Google may introduce a badge of shame to your website if it loads slow. So Google currently, they're experimenting with having a loading screen, splash screen type thing to warn Chrome users if the loading progress bar um, is loading too slow. You remember that? Remember on uh, Internet Explorer, it was at the bottom right. It was a little green loading bar. Um, and I think on Chrome, it's at the top, isn't it? It's in the top URL, like it shows when it's loading. So if the website is loading slow, if due to like it's not optimized, maybe it has really large images or maybe it has some other stuff on there that uh, is preventing it from loading quickly, uh, then Chrome will give a little badge to show that, uh, which I guess would mean for the web domain a web host to uh, try to optimize the site uh, better, which I don't know. People are calling it a badge of shame. <laughs> I mean, if you have a slow website, then you try to fix it, I guess. But uh, yeah, um, what do they say here? I, I wrote in a quote, we are building, we are building out speed badging is I think what they're calling it. Speed badging in close collaboration with our other teams, exploring labeling the quality of experiences at Google. Uh, explains the Chrome team. We are being very mindful of our approach and setting the bar for what is considered a good user experience and hope to land something that is practically achievable for all developers. So it looks like they're just trying to create some sort of system that helps uh, admins and uh, people who you know run websites if it's loading slow or it's being snappy and responsive. Um, yeah, something interesting. I mean, how much... You know, how much we, do we want them in on our shit? I don't really know. Um, on top of, you know, Stadia tomorrow and Half-Life, Alex, I was just announced earlier and all the stuff that's going on. Probably the biggest piece of news this week really was that Disney Plus launched. Disney Plus and it broke instantly. <laughs> I mean, this isn't like new news, like everything that launches day one is probably going to have some, you know, trouble, some problems. Um, but yeah, no, it, it broke pretty much within the first 30 minutes of it launching. And that's that's good and bad. Right. So it exceeded their expectations immensely. And I think that they uh, they weren't expecting that. Uh, Twitter users mentioned problems accessing the service and some of its features around 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Downdetector.com, which is a good site you should probably have bookmarked to go check when things are down. Uh, Downdetector.com showed about 6,900 reports of problems with the service around 7.30. That was 30 minutes after it launched. And then some of the users uh, were stating that they were not allowed to get into Disney+. Plus. However, they were able to purchase their subscription. So, of course, they were able to take your money. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, you know, this is very, very common. I don't care what service you use. If it's brand new and it comes out and it launches and it's very popular, you can fucking take it down by just popularity and trying to log in. I mean, not saying this is a DDoS, but 
because that's very intentional. But like, it's a very, it's very much a form of DDoSing where like so many people are trying to get in and uh, get into the server. It just can't handle it. Just can't handle all the, all the traffic. So, um, uh, once the service did load properly, about two hours later, uh, people were able to get in there. Uh, but some users still reporting they just had a blue screen saying uh, unavailable. Had a little picture, I think, of Mickey Mouse or something saying like, oh, we're really sorry. Sorry, something went wrong. Please try again. So uh, around 10 a.m., Disney released the following statement. The customer demand for Disney Plus has exceeded our high expectations. We are working to quickly resolve the current user issue. We appreciate your patience. That's what they said. And they had it up and running within a few hours. So people were back up and running. So that's, you know, that, that's pretty cool. It's good to have uh, another option. I don't know. When it originally was talking about it, I was just like, oh, man, another launcher. Come on, man. Another one, man. But to be honest, it's like, from what I hear, it's amazing. We don't have it. We did not purchase it. But people are really, really enjoying it. There's a lot of uh, varied content on there, a lot of movies. They're going to have a lot of exclusives. And again, it's Disney. I mean, who doesn't love Disney films? So it's very, very cool. And I think, um, I don't know, I think if you're a cord cutter and you're, you get rid of the cable box and you go to online streaming and you're doing this, I think you have a lot of great options today and you can pick and choose what you like and what you don't like. And I mean, how much do you pay for cable? I mean, some people pay hundreds of dollars for their cable box and it's bundled with internet and phone and all this other shit. But like realistically, you may pay, you're going to pay like a lot of money for a monthly cable box where now is you can just pay, you know, whatever it is, it's a lot cheaper. I mean, if, if you like Disney a lot, this may make sense. So yeah, good stuff. But Disney plus launch, everyone loved it. Um, God, oddly enough, I have more Google news here. They've been, they've been doing some shit recently. Um, not them specifically, but uh, Google's talking about offering bank accounts. You guys hear about this? We've heard about other companies offering bank accounts. Um, recently, last, what, last month? Maybe three weeks ago, uh, Uber was talking about bringing out bank accounts for their drivers to make it easier to like transfer money into their bank account with a little bit of a higher interest rate so that maybe they get a little kickback, a bunch of stuff. Um, Facebook talked about that with Libra. We talked about that, what, four months, five months ago, something like that. <clears throat> and now Google is talking about, they are possibly going to partner up with, uh, financial institutions, including Citigroup and, uh, possibly do some sort of bank account. It's part of project code named cash. Oh, that's real clever. C A C H E a cache. Please, sir, may I have more cachet? The company will become the latest Silicon Valley leader to try its hand at banking service. I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, Apple recently tried it as well. Remember, they were talking about the Apple card and a bunch of other stuff. Um, what they say here? I have a quote. We are exploring how we can partner with banks and credit unions in the U.S. to offer smart checking accounts through Google Pay, helping their customers benefit from useful insights and budgeting tools while keeping their money in an FDIC uh, insured account. We look forward to sharing more details in the coming months. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. You know what's scary? You know who's scared about all this sort of thing? Banks. <laughs> Banks. <laughs> They've been around forever. And now we have these tech companies who are trying to like create bank accounts. And uh, it's kind of like the Wild West. The Wild Wild West. <laughs> yeah, so like banks are kind of like, what the fuck are you doing? Stay out of our wheelhouse. We're over here making our money. We are fucking over the customers already. Leave, leave us alone and let us continue to fuck over customers and make our money. Stay out of it. I mean, why do you think these companies want in on it? Either because banks are fucking us over. They have for all the time. Um, giving us, you know, we're putting our hard-earned money into their accounts and we're getting nothing in return. In fact, in fact, I don't want to go too deep into it, but like some accounts, like you have to have a certain amount of money coming in every month, has to have a certain balance, you know, it has to be this and that, your, your savings account has to be this and that. It's fucking, it's like they have you over the coals, man. So I don't know if this is a good thing. I don't know. Would you trust your money, putting your money in Google? 
I don't know. Would you trust your money in Facebook? Fuck no. Would you trust your money with Apple? Uh, uh, I, I don't know about that either. So we have to really <laughs> we're gonna think about this. There's a lot to consider. A lot of new stuff going on. <laughs> uh, how about some more VR talk? The real, the feel real mask. Okay, it's called the feel real mask. It will let you smell different scents inside of your VR games during your VR experience. So what? Get some help. What? Um, I originally saw this and started dying laughing. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? My nose knows. I'm very scent sensitive. I can smell all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, this would probably trip me the fuck out. Um, okay, so get this. It is a device that attaches to the bottom of your VR headset. It uses magnets. It's able to attach to most VR headsets, Vive, Oculus, Index, a bunch of others. And it uses nine aroma capsules that are inserted into the mask. And these scents can then be sprayed into your face, depending on what's happening in the game, including coffee, lavender, gunpowder, uh, burning rubber for tires and racing games, and many, many others. So I'm, I'm laughing about this, right? I'm like, what the fuck? Like, dude, like, okay, now let's bring out Fart Simulator. Now let's bring it out. But I started to research it, and I started to look at it, and I think I'd kind of want to try it. <laughs> I'd want to experience it at least once. And I thought of this because a long time ago, in the early 2000s, when I went out to Disneyland, I went to California Adventure. And that's the park that's across from Disneyland Anaheim. And it's a whole California theme. It has all this great California theme stuff. And they had a ride called Soren Over California. Or Soren, Soren over Cali or Soren over LA. Soren over something. Soren over California. It's basically you sit in these chairs. They lift you up about 10 feet in the air. The bottom is dark. You can't see. So you feel like you're suspended in just infinite, right? Into outer space. They have this huge like dome, this huge like massive IMAX that's around you. It goes all the way up and behind you. So like you can't, you can't see the end of it. And you just are like flying. You're soaring. And they have this like camera that just flies over the Golden Gate Bridge and you go downtown, you go through the Redwoods, you go through all these great, beautiful places in California. In that ride, they have fans and air that blows uh, on you. They have like you go over some volcanoes and they like blow hot air and you go over like these clouds and they blow cold air on you. But also they have pine and a bunch of other stuff that sprays into the atmosphere in there that you smell as you go through these parts. And it was really, really cool. So part of me is laughing. I'm laughing about this because I'm like, what the fuck, dude? You know, I'm not going to like, this is ridiculous. And then I thought, wait, I really enjoyed that soaring over California ride. So this might actually might be kind of cool. So I want to try it, but I see some issues with it. I'll, I'll talk about them here in a second. I'll show you pictures. I have pictures of this too. You'll see. Um, so the mask is also multi-sensory, it says, giving the users the, sens the sensation through micro heaters and coolers. So there it is again, can blow hot and cold air, depending. Um, it's compatible with other VR headsets and quite a few have already mentioned that. It looks like it was on a Steam Index or maybe it's an Oculus. Oh no, all of them actually. I got a screenshot of this. Um, it was on a, it was on Kickstarter. All right. So it was a Kickstarter. It looks like it was funded a bunch of stuff going on here. Let me uh, pop open a picture so you guys can see it. So here it is. Here's the mask. It's the bottom part of this mask. All right. You can see Let me zoom in on it so you can see a little bit better. It's that bottom part. So it basically attaches to the bottom of your, uh, your mask sits over your nose and your mouth. So like a part of me is like, hey, this this could kind of be, be cool, right? Unless you're playing fart simulator, right? Wind, heat. There's a VR with a phone in there. Water mist. What? It sprays water? Wait, I didn't even know that. That's fucked. So a couple of thoughts about it. One, um, if you have to use these aroma packs, you like load them in these cartridges. The only thing I can think about is replacing the ink cartridge on my fucking printer. And what do we all hate doing the most? What is the biggest crock of shit, scam, bullshit thing that we have to do when we print? 
is replace those damn cartridges. What do you do? Oh, let's go in to Office Depot. Let's go to Amazon. Let's order our, our ink cartridges. How much are they? Wow, they're 60 bucks for a fucking pack of 10. What? Why is it so expensive? Okay, screw you then. I'm going to go and to one of these third-party retailers and have it refilled. I'll take my cartridge in. I'll have it refilled. That's great because, you know, I'm not going to spend that kind of money to buy all these new ones. Screw them. I walk in there. What happens? Oh, it's $40 to have it refilled. $40. I'm only saving 20 bucks. I mean, and it won't... What the... F it doesn't make any sense. This whole thing doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. So, I'm getting super triggered about these... These cartridges, I just think like we're gonna have to reload them. I don't know how much they cost to replace. I don't know. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but that's that's gonna be a problem. Um, yeah, but I mean, there's no doubt it kind of looks cool, right? I mean, like look at that's here on Oculus. It looks kind of neat, doesn't it? You know, I read something really cool. I was a uh, I was a uh, uh, looking at the Kickstarter, their campaign there. Which, by the way, the mask cost $209. Now, that is a Kickstarter exclusive. If you do not support it on Kickstarter, it cost $300. Yeah, I tried to save that to the very end because uh, if you were at all interested during that whole thing, you're probably not anymore. $300 is too much. That is fucking crazy. I don't care. I don't care if it massages your face while you're playing games. That is too much money. That is a huge one. So, uh, yeah, very interesting. Um, but I did read um, an article and looking at their Kickstarter campaign that the there was a, a, a person, a single person who actually was one of their first backer, actually was their first backer. And evidently, according to the Kickstarter, pre-ordered 100 of these, 100 of these. Right off the bat, like, Saw them, ordered them. Very interesting. You know who it was? You want to know who did that? This guy right here. Hey, good jokes are good jokes. It's Boba Fett, by the way, if you can't see the, the video footage of it. Because <laughs> this mask looks identical to it. <laughs> Come on, I get a little, come on, give me this. No, okay, everyone's mad. Everyone's mad at me. I'm trying to do something around here, trying to be random. <laughs> the Nintendo Entertainment System. Wow, is it 35 years old? It certainly is. Uh, so let's celebrate with a mouse. Wait, what? Bruh. What? Uh, 8 Do is added again with a 2.4 gigahertz wireless mouse inspired by the NES using the matte gray and black and red design has two red face buttons on the top, a D pad on the side where your thumb sits, a 3d touchpad between the two buttons for scrolling. And uh, it runs on a single double a battery, gets you about a hundred hours of life. You can order one right now on eight bit Do's website for 25 bucks. You want to see what this looks like? There it is. It looks like the earliest version of mice from the late 80s, early 90s. And um, it's basically kind of like teardrop rounded. Uh, edges are, it has straight edges on the sides, left and right, straight down. D-pad is where your thumb sits on the, uh, the left side. It has just two buttons, two basically A and B buttons like on the NES controller. And there it is. 25 bucks. Hey, I think it looks cool and I think it would be a good like a uh, prop or cosmetic something to like your your display like if it was sitting back behind me on a display or something very cool. Um but usability? Nah, that's that's a casual mouse. You couldn't use it for gaming, you couldn't use it for anything other than other than browsing and clicking on websites and doing that, checking your mail. I don't think it's really beneficial any other way. But very cool and I like the look of it. 25 bucks. I mean, you might as well might as well throw down. Um, some Twitch news. Actually, Twitch Studio Beta, it went in a uh, private beta about a month ago. Uh, and I was invited to take part in that and look at the software, which I did. It was It's actually very, very good. Um, but now it launched publicly. So it is available worldwide for everyone. 
The software is still in beta, so there's going to be issues and bugs and crashes and things like that. So just be aware of that. But Twitch Studio Beta launched, and what it is, it's basically um, like I'm streaming on Twitch right now, and I'm recording this, so uh, I can make the podcast episode. But it is a program to help uh, help you stream and or record. So it's actually really useful. And I looked at it. Everything is kind of not so much automated, but there's a lot of tools to help in the automation. It doesn't give you deep configuration tools. So it doesn't doesn't give you that option, which I like because I'm a tweaker and a geeker. But I think for a lot of people who aren't, who just want to pop open a game, put their headphones on, set up their mic, pick their game, pick their mic, set the levels and go live. It's perfect for that. It really is. And I have to give them credit. I really do like it. And I see uh, the value of it. I really do. And if you're trying to just like make a quick recording, make a quick video or something uh, on your PC to record something, it's great. Maybe you want to do, do like tutorials or maybe you want to do YouTube videos. Like it's a great resource. I mean, I still would recommend jumping into like OBS or something that's community supported and it has plugins and a lot. They can do VST plugins and do a bunch of great stuff to help with audio and plugins with video and all sorts of great stuff. But uh, yeah, I would um, uh, definitely take a look at it and it's free 99. So that's really cool. Um, yeah. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there kind of doing like overviews of it. If you're at all interested in streaming and you haven't started streaming and haven't really jumped into anything yet, uh, take a look at it. Might be worth your while. Okay. Uh, as we round out some of the, uh, the news here in tech. This was another big one. And I just started seeing ads about this yesterday. But ladies and gentlemen, the Motorola Razor. You remember the Razor from back in the, in the mid-2000s? Moto Razor is back. And it is real. We've talked about this in earlier episodes about getting leaked screenshots, which look nothing like what the real thing is here. But folks, it is a real phone. It is a flip phone. And it is a foldable phone. Yes. So when you open it up, it goes completely flat and the whole phone is a screen. And I got to say, I think it looks sexy as hell. I really, really like it. Now, me personally, the Motorola Razr was the last flip phone I owned. What was my one before that? I had the Moto, like it was an M90 or something. Little small gray one kind of rounded on the bottom. It had a little antenna stuck out the side or the top. And uh, fuck, man. Here's the thing with me and flip phones. I break them all the time. Every flip phone I've ever had, I've broke. Because I have my pocket. I open it up. The antenna like snaps off. Even the old Nokia's when I had the little Nokia 5600 or whatever they were, 6800. I broke the antennas off of those two. And I couldn't get any reception for shit. And so I'm always like... Uh, so then when they came out with the sliver, the SLVR, remember the sliver? I bought two of those, by the way, which just, just to let everyone know, I'm going to do an after party on Patreon. Um, and I'm going to show off my, uh, cell phone collection. I'm going to do it. I have a lot of those phones still, all my Nokia's, all my Motorola's, all those old ass phones. I still have them cause I'm fucking weird, but anyway, I'm going to show them off. Um, I don't know what I was talking about. Oh yeah, no, the sliver. That was the last phone that I had and, uh, and it wasn't flip. And that's why I bought it because it wasn't, it was just a, a solid, solid phone. So, but anyway, I have a picture of this. I'll show it to you guys here. I, I honestly, I really like the look of it. I think it's quite attractive, quite nice looking. As you can see, it has a screen on the front of it too, when you close it. So you have a screen out there and it looks like it has quick keys there, uh, you know, on the, on the face there for buttons to press. Messaging looks like mail, looks like a chat, something else. And then when you open it up fully, it gives you the options for uh, there's camera, there's Google Photos, there's Chrome, there's chat, there's phone. There's a bunch of other stuff in there. I got to be honest, dude, this is looking pretty, pretty slick. I mean, and then you fold it up and you put it in your pocket. It's like half the size of a normal phone. I don't know. I, I, I like it. And Motorola they make great products. So it's not a piece of shit. The whole like foldable phone though, it's still, I hate to say it, we're still too early on in its life to know the longevity of this. Like how many folds can it do? Remember Samsung? We had some issues. <laughs> Mistakes were made. All right. People broke them pretty quick. 
So um, I feel like Motorola wouldn't release this until they fully tested it, right? I don't know. Something to, something to look at, keep our eye on. And if you do happen to get one, I would like you to write me and let me know what you think about it. And uh, some other news just about that real quick is, uh, here's a kicker. It is 1500 US dollars. Yeah, now, couple things to talk about regarding that. $1,500 phone, that puts it in a very interesting position. One, it is more than the iPhone, the iPhone 11 Pro Max to the extreme, whatever it's called. It's 500 bucks more than that, all right? So it puts it at more expensive than the iPhone, but as a foldable phone, it puts it way less than the other offerings. What was the other foldable phone? It was like Samsung was like 1200 bucks or 20, 2500 bucks or something. Something crazy. So it kind of puts it a little, it's the cheapest foldable phone, but it's the most expensive phone above iPhone, I guess. And then even like, you know, the, the Google pixels and all that, like they're, they're pretty expensive as well. So like it puts it just above that. So something to ponder, something to think about. Um, are you interested in foldable phones? I am, but I'm not going to get one at that price. I think down the road maybe, and I think it would be cool, but like, no, I'm not, I'm not really interested in spending that kind of money. Not when I can't front the cash for a fucking a steam index. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's definitely something to think about. <laughs> uh, before we wrap up the show, I want to go ahead and hop back over here to Patreon and just say a quick couple of words about this. Uh, folks, all of the people you see here on your screen, Game Loft, Main Floor, and Ground Floor tiers here, I want to thank all of you personally for your support on Patreon. I'm going to give a round of applause. Yeah, baby. Um, the, the most important thing... Um, I want to mention is that this allows the podcast to continue on and, and, and be something. And it means so much to me that you're here supporting and uh, giving to me. And I like to give back as well. So I do lots of other stuff on Patreon. I do car vlogs. I actually just released one publicly uh, this morning. Actually, so go to my YouTube channel, check it out. We did, uh, I did a car vlog just to show people kind of what I do behind the scenes and let them know, give them a little taste of it. If you like it, you can support on Patreon and get more of those. Of course, my entire music discography is there. Uh, I'm releasing an EP on the 25th. I'm making physical limited run copies of that. If you're in the game loft here, you can, you're going to get one absolutely free. That is where you can secure your copy. I've only made a hundred of them when they are sold out. They're sold out. I'm not making any more. Um, so yeah, all of my music in digital format, high quality format, and amongst many other things that are there. So please check it out. I try to give back as much as you give to me and I appreciate you so much. Patreon.com slash Jason Heine is where you go, of course. And lastly, um, HeineHouse.com is my website. That is where it all comes together. Go there and check out all of the great stuff that I've got up there. I update it regularly and also um, all of the info on my EP is there right on the homepage. Baby, baby. 503 908 5490. Hey, after the show ends, just pick up your phone and give it a call. 503-908-5490. Talk about this stuff. Like, let me know about foldable phones. Let me know about Stadia. Let me know about some stuff that's going on in your life. What's happening? I'd love to know. Please do. Send it on by. 503-908-5490 is the phone number. Just a voicemail. Leave it to me. Hey, and uh, lastly, before we say goodbye and I play a song for you guys, uh, the community event is still going on. We have one more week of it. Hashtag new game November. What are the games that you're playing in November? What are you looking forward to? There's a lot. And I'll even take it to the end of the year. What is What games are you looking forward to that are coming out? November, December. What's going to be happening? What are you going to be playing? And pop it over on Discord. Post a picture. Tell a story. Let us know. Discord can be found, the link in the description below, uh, in the show notes, and then, of course, on my website, heinehouse.com. That's how it goes. Thank you for the cheers, folks. You're all giving me cheers at the end of the show. I really appreciate that. That means a lot. Thank you. Really appreciate that. I'm going to close the show out like I do every time. 
with uh, one of my original songs that you can get, you can purchase, you can listen to, you can stream uh, and enjoy. And everyone's been really writing in and saying how much they really love my HQLP project. Stands for High Quality Long Play. And um, I did that earlier this year when I started to get involved with Vaporwave and Malt Soft, kind of chill hop type stuff, which I will continue this project. Um, but yeah, this is um, a song that I call uh, Freight by Truck. I, what I typically do is I just go in and grab like old Weather Channel songs or old songs that you'd hear in Elevator uh, type songs, like weird instrumental type stuff, and then twist it and tweak it and fuck it over and and pitch them and do weird stuff, add crazy effects, add drums, add vocals, do whatever I feel, just whatever happens, happens. And whatever comes out on the other end is this. And so people have really been enjoying them. And I really appreciate that. I've seen a, a little spike on downloads on my Bandcamp page for this. So thank you. I love you guys so much. And I love Soulstorm. I love the little emotes there with the little <laughs> MP3 file, music file. Looking good. Looking good. All right, folks. This song is called Freight by Truck. And uh, oh, you'll hear. It's pretty fun. It's a good little tune. I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful week. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye now. Thank you.